uh, were constructing the immune system for New York City. That was the, the primary thing. They were acting as immunological cells to keep astral spirits at bay. Mm -hmm. uh, Gernity wants nothing to do with the magical and mythical consciousness structures uh, with bird-headed men, you know, like Spider-Man fighting Vulture. The, you know, that's basically the, the Egyptian Ba there. Or, or any of a host of villains who are all, you know, they're always endlessly recycled from ancient myth. And the job of the superhero is to keep them out of the city because they're at odds with modernity. Modernity thinks that it is dispensed with the astral and the supernatural. And so now, with the graphic novel, though, uh, the graphic novel tends to have lost faith in the superhero's ability uh, to function as an immune cell. And so there's more of a closer, the, the, the problem is more fixated on the sense of identity. Who am I? How do I construct my identity? And how, using this or that superhero, and this is especially true in something like Watchmen, how do I find my identity using the math? That, that tends to be the key issue of today. See, I see the key issue, the key philosophical issue of our civilization today is the issue of identity. Identity is what is fueling a great deal of the violence in the world. There's a, there's a loss of certainty because identity, too, has come unmoored from the transcendental signifieds that it used to be embedded in. So people aren't certain anymore who they are, what group they belong to, whether they are self-sufficient entities unto themselves, or whether that's an old metaphysical age idea. And the graphic novels are a way of sort of helping the young especially uh, work this out by reading through them. and Because and, they're all about the quest for identity, every single one of them. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. That's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> how do you feel, uh, another one of the things I liked about um, giant humans is there is a sense of incorporating a lot of um, European artists and you one of the highlights I think of the book is also Arzak your discussion of that um, and I was wondering what do you think of as some of the central differences between the intellectual schools of um, Europe's sort of philosophy of the comic book and the graphic novel and um, America's philosophy and also uh, just how that relates, I guess, academically, what the differences are, you know, in terms of the academic intellectual responses to sure. the medium. Yeah, the, um, the European school, the so-called Van Dessene group, uh, is a different development, and I kind of didn't want to include too much of that in this book, because I mainly wanted to focus on the American development, for, for the same reason I left manga out, which is a, um, a separate development there, that those cultures have different semiotics and mm -hmm. something different. Um, I did include the essay on Mobius. Uh, Mobius's Arzak is the first essay in the book. is a way of tipping my hat to Heavy Metal Magazine, which was one of my favorite magazines growing up as a kid. Yeah, that's it, great. Yeah, that, that introduced me, and I suspect it introduced a lot of people to, uh, to the world of European uh, science fiction. European yeah. science fiction does tend to have separate semiotics. It's not quite as gadgety oriented and it's not quite as pragmatically oriented, it's more theoretically oriented, it's more interested in, like, like with artists like Gruyere and Jimenez and Jodorowsky. Um, Jodorowsky takes on space opera, for instance, in the Incal, but he does it tongue-in-cheek and it becomes almost a kind of satire of space opera. Um, there's a sense in which they don't take quite so seriously uh, the trappings of science fiction the way for Americans it's almost a religion. It's taken, you know, at, at a value uh, of seriousness that it, that it almost becomes a religion. So there's that. There's that difference in, in function. Yeah. That work, though, tends to be much better. The Europeans are much better artists, like Francois Scheiten, for example. Just an amazing artist. And like you said, Gruyere is one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. um, amazing artwork. So the artwork does tend to be better. Um, the stories are a little different, though. They're slower moving, and the semiotics have more to do, less to do with the crisis of identity and immunological problems than they do sometimes European political problems are in there. If you look at Enki Bilal's uh, stories about the Nikopol trilogy, the whole thing is a political allegory of political problems in France. Yeah, that's a fantastic series. It is. And that's something that would never do, just never happen in American science fiction, which is always concerned with you know, fighting the bad guys and trying to understand the semiotics of the bad guys. Um, so I left that out for the most part and just wanted to focus on this development since the graphic novel, for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, uh, is an invention of uh, the 1970s Americana, beginning with things like Richard Corbin's uh, Blood Star um, and Jim Steranko's Red Tide and Gil Kane's Blood Mark. 
Um, that's kind of where it starts to happen. Jack Kirby does the novelization of 2001 A Space Odyssey, and it's this big oversized thing. I remember buying that as a kid on the newsstands, this big oversized uh, thing. There wasn't even a word for it yet. It was just a large comic book. It was huge, like mm. the size of a newspaper. But he was pioneering the graphic novel there. Um, so that's my take on that. Yeah, um, it's interesting too. Like I think of Miyazaki's um, Nausicaa, and it there is a like a even though it deals in sort of the um, uh, it's not Nausicaa actually. There's another one that I am forgetting the title of, but he he's dealing with a post-apocalyptic framework, and there's definitely a, a playfulness about it. So I, I definitely agree. There there does seem to be almost kind of a like a mocking <laughs> in a sense, and it's I guess it's sometimes the incorporation or translation of what they see of as American culture to kind of their own um, standpoint on it. It's interesting. Um, in, the, in Miyazaki also, there's a lot of playing around with Japanese Shinto and Kami spirits. Yeah. Also, mention of... Uh, Lots uh, of shamanistic stuff for yeah, sure. Ancient uh, Japanese religious past is always somehow present and in interfacing with this you know, technological carapace that has been placed over their culture. Uh, but only it's like a surface level thing. The real thing is the dialogue with the Kami spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are your thoughts on the idea that uh, superhero narratives seem to be slowly sort of fading out? It seems like the more Hollywood kind of pushes these, you know, really ridiculously high budget um, superhero movies, and the they definitely seem to be reaching the peak of um, their popularity. And I think of you know, indie crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter definitely sort of shake things up as far as um, the corporate vested in interest in um, the money involved in uh, pumping out just superhero, you know, mythology after another. I'm curious, because uh, it, it's definitely something that you talk about in the book, so I'm, I'm curious um, as to how you came to those conclusions. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the superhero genre as, as a genre is itself already crumbling. There, there's a loss of faith in it. I think almost at the time the graphic novel even comes into being, there's already a loss of faith in it. By the time you get to, you know, 1986 and The Dark Knight Returns, Watchmen, uh, both of those graphic novels, and those are two of the greatest graphic novels ever written, I think everyone's in consensus on that, mm -hmm. um, is already suffering from a disenchantment with the idea of the superhero. Uh, Batman in The Dark Knight Returns is this shambling old grizzled 50-something guy who keeps tripping on his cape and can't fight, you know, in one-to-one -one combat anymore mm -hmm. and has to rely on larger and larger machines to help him um, and barely manages to survive. He has to stage his own death at the end of the narrative. And in Watchmen, the characters are sort of like, they're disenchanted with their own masks and the party is over. They're, they're second or even third generation superheroes and the party is over for them and they've lost their enthusiasm for putting on the mask and going out and, and fighting crime. It just doesn't seem to have the same appeal anymore. So I think that both of those narratives, and there are other ones like Ronan, another Frank Miller uh, work, Ronan shows the actual disintegration of the immune system of New York. It shows that immune system crumbling and falling apart, and in the semiotic vacancy left behind by the absence of any kind of superheroes left to fight, they have to construct a brand new superhero, this Ronan figure, was constructed out of the astral body of an ancient samurai plus this physical body plus this weird plastic technology that's self-organizing that ends up producing a new god who becomes the new immune system for New York City. So, so clearly the superhero genre is dying. The moment of the death of any medium is its sunset effect when you get the largest spectacular treatment of it. The sort of Nagasaki flash is indeed, as you say, Hollywood, where superheroes have been translated into Hollywood that's going to be their big final flash. That will cycle down. It's already, everyone's already sick of it. I don't want to see another superhero movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm done with the genre myself. And yeah, absolutely. Most 20-year-olds uh, will, will soon be done with it as well. Uh, it just doesn't appeal anymore. Nobody buys it. It doesn't. But the, the semiotics of the society have changed. Identity is still one of the big issues, and it's going to continue to be one of the big issues for a long time to come because it's fueling a lot of the global violence. Spree killers, for, exa for example, are a function of an identity that has gone awry. Um, but the superheroes aren't helping with that anymore because no one takes them seriously. And I think it's probably uh, milks a few more of these out. Cinema, anyway, as I've written in my book, Post-Classic Cinema, is itself a medium. 
that is in trouble, that is in decline. Most of the good writers have gone on to television now, and television is at its, its apogee as a medium. All the good writing is now taking place in television on the one hand and in graphic novels on the other. Those are the two great media of our time. And what we're looking at is a, you know, a media midden heap, a collapsed midden heap of, of, of dying media forms that are left over from the industrial age. Film came into being in the industrial age, but uh, we're long since post-industrial, and the novel goes way back, uh, even pre-industrial. So we're looking at the ruins of the metaphysical age that is cycling down into this sort of plasmic uh, age of liquefying forms, as Zygmunt Bauman calls it, liquid modernity. The forms of the culture are all liquefying, and we're all just sort of sorting through this scrap heap, looking to see what imaginary significations, to borrow from Castoriadis, might, might serve to hold in place uh, to fixate long enough to create a new civilization out of this. But for right now, the forms are all melting and, and liquefying, and it's very difficult to try and construct a new society with liquid forms that, that won't gel. So, you know, it's an experiment. Yeah, it's very interesting. It reminds me of, um, well, Kick-Ass was sort of the first movie that really mocked um, superheroes and was very... Yes. playful to the extreme and, and also self-conscious to the extreme about just the, the genre itself and the tropes of the genre and things. And then I'm also reminded of <clears throat> Alan Moore, who has recently taken quite a bit of flack from just kind of, he <clears throat> has a habit of insulting fans and insulting comic book readers in general, just making fun of almost a kind of infantile um, obsession and fascination with the superhero, which um, is definitely out, but still kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. there are people that sort of cling on to it. It's a, it's like, a, you know, the, the fading of a religion or something. It's like the Harlan Ellison of the, the graphic novel. Yeah. Ellison used to love to do that, hurl insults at fans, but yet nobody was more knowledgeable about science fiction than Ellison. He was a walking encyclopedia. <laughs> right, right. More is exactly like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I'm curious how you think uh, there there is a threat of um, neo tribalism, and that this is something that Marshall McLuhan gets into quite a bit. Um, and it, you, your work has made me aware of that of the ways in which um, neo tribalism functions in the culture. And I know I think your first uh, main men mention of this was in your discussion of Watchmen and how in Watchmen there there is a lot of that. Um, kind of the masks serve as sort of shamanic signifiers for like the new violence um, that occurs kind of in um, society. Could you unpack that a little bit and then I want to talk about how that relates to how neo-tribalism relates to the electronic dance music scene because I believe that there there are a lot of um, indications there of kind of an inverted um, shamanism that's going on, the endless party scene, you know, that sort of thing. Okay. Well, neo-tribalism is a function of, of what uh, I think the theoretician Heiner Muehlmann would call disruptive cultures, uh, or if that, you know, that's from the point of view of the host culture, we could call them, uh, a, a better term might be subversive cultures. And subversive cultures flourish uh, inside the mother body of host cultures when those uh, host cultures are breaking down. Uh, it's a little bit like Arnold Toynbee talking about uh, the internal proletariat that begins to emerge in a civilization as it secedes from the body social when it loses faith with the dominant authority that's leading the society. And I think that's what's happening on a global scale. This happens everywhere. On the one hand, we have the disintegration of all these old metaphysical age things like the nation state. Once the nation state as a containing vessel disintegrates, as it did in the form of Yugoslavia, then all these ethnic tribal conflicts come up. You get the Serbs versus the Bosnian Muslim. Anyone who isn't a Serb uh, needs to be uh, ethnically cleansed, put into a concentration camp, and so forth. you got the same thing uh, in Rwanda with the Hutu versus the Tutsi, uh, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, annihilating uh, all the anyone who wasn't one of them. All over the world we see these, these tribal factions come into being when there's a loss of faith in the metaphysically containing structure of the nation state. Once the nation state breaks down, People resort to the first kind of what the reason Butari would call a primitive territorial regime. That is a polite word for saying a barbaric formation, a primitive type of society. Because those are the Ur societies, these barbarian tribal warlords and bands, they start springing up all over the place. Uh, but within the mother body of, let's say, Western civilization, we've got neo tribalism everywhere you look. You have gangs in LA, you have 
Hells Angels, Bikers, you have the Mafia, 